Good evening. Welcome to the end of day five um, of the, yeah, day five. That's legit. We have been here behind these screens for five days. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us and for everyone who's joining us this evening um, for the last but not least uh, session of the day. Um, and we're really excited about this one. I'm going to do a bit of an introduction and say um, thank you so much for the last session as well. It was like fire and warmed us up perfectly for this one. I'm really, really excited to be just to be joined by just so many, so many brilliant, beautiful uh souls and hello to Sahima again for the second night in a row very happy to see your very smiling face on the screen okay so tonight we have got a bit of a dream uh, situation for you we are running 30 minutes behind and the panel have kindly agreed to stick to the 90 minutes so we're going to go 30 minutes over um, and make sure we get the full um, brilliance of everyone um, okay so I'm going to do some intros first um, we've got Adelia, Adelia Young. Adelia is an educator and writer based in Oakland, California. Big up Oakland for everything. Big up Oakland. Um, it's uh, and centers discussions around blackness and resistance. Uh, Adelia is co-founder of the Novalia Collective, editor and compiler of a Fly Girls Guide to University. You can find Adelia on Twitter at Adelia underscore Young. Um, we've got Wythera Sabat Sabatindra. Co-author also of the Fly Girls Guide to University. You'll see a little theme here, and you might remember have remembered this at the, the event that was at the Hub if you were able to come to it. Um, and she was the first black woman to be elected as women's officer on the Cambridge University Students' Union. Yes. If you haven't seen the link, also Priya is, is a professor at Cambridge, right? So that's one of the reasons why we sort of bookended this, because um, she's doing amazing work. And here's some of the, the incredible students. Um, well, not students now, right? Like students who graduated and now are doing even more badassery. And then we've got Sahima Monzur Khan, educator, poet, poet writer, um, dis disrupting narratives of history, race, violence, gender, Islamophobia, and knowledge. She's the host of Breaking Binaries podcast, and she's on Twitter as the Brown Hijabi. Um, we're really excited to welcome you all. And of course, um, if you have only just um, uh, logged into the session and you weren't here for my uh, description of Alia. I'm going to go again, yo, because we're getting close. We're going to day five, right? So I just need to tell you that you need to hire this person like 100% all the time. Pay your coins because um, Alia is a legend. Right, so I'm going to read Alia's bio because after you've he heard this, if you're hearing it for the first time, and if you're not hearing it for the first time, well, go to the website because there's loads of brilliant things on there and you'll come across a treat of a page. And when you find it, I want you to then tweet us because it's a legendary page, right? Uh, so basically, Alia, um, if you click on the who's, the who's That Girl, we'll tell you that uh, my name is Alia. I'm a curator, writer, and filmmaker whose work focuses on decolonial approaches to history and the present day. I curate exhibitions, produce events, festivals, creative strategies, consult on campaigns, projects, as well as making films, writing poetry, scripts, and shit captions. I also facilitate and public speak Basically, if I enjoy it, I do it. And then you skip a couple of paragraphs because I can't make this the Alia a show as much as I'd like to. Um, Alia says, it's important that to me that I that love and care are at the center of my practice so we can envision and awake new possibilities for ourselves and others. I believe that's where innovation lies. This sometimes means hard conversations are had, but having them enriches the work and understanding further. I will always speak my mind as I have no business speaking everyone else's mind. And Ali is one of the co-curators on the festival um, and has been putting together some really beautiful stuff the last few days. If you haven't seen them, wait for the videos to come out. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Alia. Alia is going to um, facilitate the first bit, which is some sort of micro lecture provocations from um, uh, the, the wonderful panel. And then we're going to have a conversation and some questions. Get your questions in, get your love in. And let's enjoy this Sunday evening together, right? As we burn it all down and rebuild it in our image. Um, anyway, I'm gonna shimmy on into the backstage, Bye. put my feet up, grab a cup of tea. And uh, I look forward to this uh, great session. Thank you so much to everyone for giving us your Sunday evenings. Enjoy. 
Thank you so much, Emmy. Hello, hi, assalamu alaikum, wagwan, all that good stuff. Um, welcome to today's session. And just a huge big up to Emmy, like Nikki, um, Indy, Zaz, Daniel, Tom, everyone else who's also part of the team for the incredible work and things that they've been doing. We're, we're on day five, home stretch, one more day to go. And it's been an incredible um, series of dreamy, 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 lectures, workshops, conversations, and just such, so honored to be part of it today. Um, and continually, today's conversation, as Amy has already introduced, is, is gonna be a lit one, is gonna be a good one. I'm very, very excited to hear the micro lectures that we have going um, on today, and um, just generally weaving in and out of conversation. So the way that we're going to run today's session is we're going to, um, have a micro lecture and then a provocation and then another micro lecture provocation and then we'll have um, some conversation and um, comments from those of you watching. Uh, well thank you Elia and Demi for those introductions. Um, like this guy said I'm Waidera um, and I was originally going to talk about reimagining populism but then Sahima reminded me that I actually really, really love talking about health and wellness. So I thought I could talk about that instead. So yeah, for me, when I think about reimagining wellness in a post-capitalist, post-imperialist world, um, the place that I start from is remembering that the world as it currently exists makes us sick. Um, and I think one of the people or groups that does a good job of, of talking about that is the Bare Minimum Collective, which is an experimental arts collective based in London. Um, that's kind of anti-work, anti-wage labor, um, and is spending this year focusing on all the ways that the world makes us sick. Um, and the fact of the matter is that uh, today, medical institutions tend to obscure this fact uh, by presenting the health um, disability issues that we have as individual and uh, the product of our own bodies going wrong. Um, so it's clear that the world makes some of us sicker than others. And so when I say that the world makes us sick, I'm talking about um, the way that capital uses and abuses and exploits our bodies um, and affects them in material, uh, mental, physical ways uh, and leaves us to deal with that. Um, and so obviously some of us are going to be rendered more sick than others, uh, black people, uh, people with physical impairments already, women, etc. cetera. Um, so we're rendered sicker, um, but then we're accused um, of our bodies actually being the problem. Um, uh, there are claims that we are inherently sick uh, or disabled. And so you can track this history among black people, for example, from justifications for slavery um, that would create uh, black people or black bodies as inherently intellectually disabled and thereby um, uh, making our slavery and our exploitation justifiable. And that carries on to the present day when you see that even though black people across the western world are uh, are suffering and dying from COVID at disproportionate rates uh we're being blamed for having bodies that were already sick be it through the existence of pre-existing conditions that we already have um with no examination of why there would be a preponderance of certain illnesses within certain communities um and we even see the same um in some justifications for george floyd's murder where it's it's brought up that he had COVID several weeks before um, and so that must have impacted whether or not he, he was killed by this police officer. So I think that we need healthcare that understands um, that the categories of race, of gender and of disability are mutually constituted, that disability um, and in many cases illness in and of itself is, uh, is a social construct um, that's sort of shaped by the historical material conditions of our time. Um, so we need to have understandings of how those categories are created, how they um, replace each other, how they hold each other up, uh, alongside accumulating and honing knowledge of how our bodies can and do fuck up, um, and uh, expanding the knowledges of the ways that different kinds of bodies can do that. So, for example, looking at projects um, that try and expand doctors' knowledge of how um, a, a, dermatolog a dermatological illness would look different on black or white skin, for example. Uh, we need healthcare that uh, empowers us to advocate for ourselves, that comes from our communities, ideally, and really importantly, that presages the healthcare of a socialist future, uh, because we can't simply wait until then to start creating and thinking about what healthcare will look like. We have to start doing that stuff now. Uh, but we also need healthcare that reckons with the past. So, for example, healthcare that acknowledges and works with Black people's justifiable suspicion of medical institutions 
uh, due to things like uh, the experimentation on our bodies um, by gynecologists during the Tuskegee um, experiment. Uh, and this healthcare also needs to be of the present uh, in that we can know that the material conditions of our lives may never allow us to be healthy, um, by which I mean happy, our whole selves, or at the very least free of illness, uh, but that we still have room to make ourselves as unsick as possible. And so when I think about that, I think about something that Audre Lorde wrote in A Burst of Light, uh, where she talks about how in order to win, the aggressor has to conquer, uh, but all we have to do is survive. And so it's our role to define survival in ways that are acceptable and nourishing to us. And I think that has very clear implications for wellness. What is it to survive a world that is constantly trying to make us sick, accepting that we may never achieve the level of health that uh, we're you know, capable of by virtue of our humanity, um, but still trying to define our survival in ways that are acceptable and nourishing to us. So I thought I'd focus on the many examples that we already have of how people in the past and in the present are already reimagining um, healthcare. So the first example that comes to mind is women and people uh, more generally who can get pregnant uh, sharing information on contraception. And this has been going on, you know, for as long as um, our pregnancies have been regulated, our bodies have been regulated. Um, maybe this isn't understood by a lot of people as, as radical, um, but it is a group of people refusing to to hand over their agency to others. Um, I'm thinking as well of groups like NYC Action Medical um, that are giving first aid training to protesters. Um, so that's another way of, you know, using medical knowledge for radical ends. Uh, I'm also thinking about sort of 12 step addiction programs. Um, so if anything, the stigma surrounding addiction has been useful when it comes to these programs because it's meant that doctors were and are more willing to admit they don't know how to treat addiction if they can simply call it a moral problem then it's easier for them to raise up their hands and say not my business to fix but what this has meant and while obviously this has meant that many um addicts historically have simply and, and present are simply left to die for this reason it has also meant that there's less gatekeeping of around addiction um, and resources and greater trust that addicts themselves are best placed to understand and even treat their illnesses. So I think what that says to me is that we need more doctors who are able to understand that there's a limit to how much they can heal us if the world is sick. Um, and in that way, um, open up the gates um, of resources, of knowledge, um, and allow us, like help us train ourselves and each other into how to help us treat ourselves basically. I'm also thinking about uh, the formation specifically of Narcotics Anonymous in the 80s, uh, where at that time, a grouping of addicts was only seen as a police magnet. Nobody else outside of that group could understand why, why a group of addicts would come together unless it was to engage in crime. And so within that healthcare, there was an acknowledgement and an understanding that addicts are more proximate to state violence and that this fact had to be acknowledged and dealt with in their healthcare. And I think this awareness that some of us are more proximate to state violence um, when we access healthcare, um, that could be more expanded, um, in my opinion. I'm also thinking about trans people uh, and who are responding to long waiting lists uh, and gatekeeping doctors uh, by engaging in sort of DIY hormone replacement therapy and creating online communities where they share this really important knowledge. Uh, and it's so important because um, there's so much evidence to show that trans people's mental health um, improves when they're allowed to access the basic healthcare that they deserve. Um, I'm thinking about this group called the Gynapunks uh, that produces open source tools uh, for DIY diagnosis and first aid care when it comes to gynecology. Um, they do things like make centrifuges from old hard drives, uh, microscopes from deconstructed webcams, homemade incubators, um, and they like put together this practical knowledge with um, teaching about the histories of gynecology uh, and the teaching about the history of the medical, um, I don't know, industrial complex. Um, and they hope that one day, you know, everybody with access to an internet, to the internet and to commonly available parts will be able to take control of their own reproductive health. Um, and as a final example, I'm thinking about Wad and Hamza al Kateb, um, who were in Aleppo during the Syrian, um, a couple of years ago during the Syrian war. And the two of them, with the help of other volunteer doctors, took over uh, a ruined the ruins of a building and set up a hospital um, that was able to not only provide immediate healthcare as a result of the war, but actually long-term healthcare um, for things like cardiac illnesses, for example, with access to very few resources. 
So all of these examples actually come from horrifying and tragic circumstances. Um, but the point that I'm making is to affirm an expansive interpretation of Toni Morrison's famous line in Beloved, all of it is now. Like we can understand all of it is now, or it has been previously understood as including the past, right? So the histories of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, all of them are now, those histories have not ended yet. But I think included in that phrase has to be that all of it is also what's to come. And so we are creating the future in which uh, we are creating the future by reimagining healthcare and putting our imaginations into action today. Uh, and so to draw briefly back to universities, um, I think that student unions are a good example of people and, and their offices are good examples of people with knowledge that we need more radical healthcare um, who are still lobbying institutions for greater resources um, to what exists right now. And I think that we can marry those two things together. We can take examples from all of these incredible groups that have provided their own community healthcare while also understanding that living in the world as it exists today we can lobby for more um you know we can expand and learn in terms of calling on governments to to take the health care of uh migrants and asylum seekers uh, more seriously even as we seek to you know disband the nation state asylum i might talk about more in future um so yeah i didn't come up with a conclusion but i just think it's very exciting um and i yeah I'm just a firm believer that it's revolutionary work to be creating the institutions that we want to exist, you know, post the revolution as it might be more um, traditionally thought of. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vera. And that potent point of literally like clicking, I was like, yes, I'm in a poetry event. Like, yeah, um, so many bars in that just generally. But um, I think it's so important around our own agency of how we create the medical institutions of the future because we know the, some of the historic bias and the historic implicit racism that has been and um, anti-class sentiment and sexism, homophobia, transphobia that is so inherent in all of these um, systems. So to sort of begin to unpack those is and believe we have agency over them is, is a really exciting prospect, but also one that has happened historically, as you've detailed. Um, I did want to bring up one of the points of like the Black Panthers, for example, and whilst that movement is very questionable for reasons of misogynoir and various different things, um, what one of their lesser known programs, not only the breakfast program for kids, but was also the medical support that they gave to black communities um, and the setups that they had in order to supply medical care for black communities who didn't have access because of a lack of franchisement and also the the lack of free health care in the US and that free starting to envision that we then start to change the conversation about how do we like remedy ourselves and our own communities um, and also believe that we have agency and um, are knowledgeable when it comes to um, ourselves and our well-being and our health care care. I did want to pick up on one of the things that you said with regards to the medical industrial complex and if you don't mind um, unpicking a little bit more of what that might mean to our audience and then we'll um, head on to the next micro lecture. Yeah sure I mean the first thing that comes to mind for me is the way in which um, people and institutions can profit off of our illnesses uh, and profit off of simply not treating us. Um, so I'm thinking about the fact, I'm thinking about like reproductive labor, uh, social reproduction, um, and the fact that the entire capitalist system is really only interested uh, in reproducing workers in sort of re-enabling us to turn up to work the next day. And anything beyond that um, is excessive. So again, thinking about this, um, through the lens of addiction, this is where you get high functioning and low functioning people, or like mental health generally. High, all high functioning means is that you can turn up to work tomorrow. Low functioning means that you can't, and therefore you're funneled into a prison or an institution. Um, and there you can be profited from in another way. If you can't produce surplus labor, then your family, etc., cetera, or, or whoever you have access to, or um, you can be engaged, uh, other people can pay for you to be in these institutions, or if you're in prison, um, you can be engaged in what is effectively slave labor. Um, so that's the first place that I think of. And it's also just a sort of a healthcare system that doesn't acknowledge its own histories of violence um, while still expecting uh, people of color, women, marginalized groups, generally trans people to engage with them in good faith. Um, so those are the two main ways that I think about it. I kind of, I've presupposed um, sort of the knowledge of, of, of histories of, of violence within 
medicine, but we could use gynecology as an example, J. Marion Sims mm. um, experimenting on three black women. Um, and doing so based on the assumption that black women don't feel as much pain as others, but also that our bodies don't matter. And it actually, it feeds in a bit to what Priya, you and Priya were talking about, this idea that sort of these racist white men were the norm. Uh, and so we can't really hold them accountable for this behavior. J. Marion Sims is also hated by his peers. They didn't like him because they knew that what he was doing was was just clearly <laughs> wrong. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's just a lack of an acknowledgement uh, of those histories, but the expectation mm. that black people, as they become aware of them, people of color, as they become aware of them, should still be turning up um, and trusting doctors. And obviously there is a whole lot of racism, sexist bias, classist bias um, across all mm. levels. Uh, from A&E to GPs um, to specialists uh, and just very little impetus within the institution itself to, to deal with those issues. Mm, and I think the case of um, J. Mary Sims is a very like interesting one in terms of how it was intentionally built to show who was important and who wasn't um, and to create these racial hierarchies that we continue to see today and just enforce them within the medical profession um, because those same procedures that the enslaved women Betsy, Lucy and I think last was Anaka who um, were treated on, were treated is not the word, um, who were experimented on by Maria, by Dr Sims, those same procedures were then used on white women and they were given anaesthetic for those same um, things and that the insidiousness of what that says we don't even have to like say what that is overtly um is very is very very telling of the practices that we see of how black women and black um trans people and black femme people in particular are treated and distrusted when they go into medical facilities today um and even to bring it to like a uk context well it's a global context of pain not being believed um, and the fact that the majority of black women that I know in the UK live with chronic conditions or have a story of not being believed when they go to the hospital so it, it is like you're saying absolutely a complex um, and the role of big pharma in that is 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 a question for a little bit later i think but thank you so much um for your micro lecture i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed i'm gonna hand it over to our second lecture from sahima take it away my love thank you um yeah thanks again to way there that was i feel like i always learn so much when you talk about these things um so moving to a different thing um different theme I wanted to think about the nation state and particularly the one in which I find myself, uh, Britain. And I was thinking about this because I, I was um, giving a lecture a couple of weeks ago um, unrelated to specifically this topic, but somebody asked, you know, within this moment of kind of the revelation to some people of racism and the depths of kind of structural white supremacy, um, they asked, you know, how do we reimagine Britain as a more inclusive and tolerant place or, or notion? And I thought it was a really interesting question because to unpack it, I think, is very revealing and uh, gets to the question that I think is much more interesting, which is why would we want to reimagine a concept like Britishness? Um, so I think with the idea of like, how do we reimagine some this, this nation to be more inclusive? I completely understand where it's coming from. I think the problem that's been identified is that Britain has been imagined very exclusively. OK, so we can look at very, you know, I'll go through a few key examples that come to my mind. Um, in 2016 or 17, um, the Louise Casey report was commissioned by the government. So this is a report to look into social integration in the UK. Uh, again, we can unpack that term. But the report is, is very revealing. And um, there's a line that I love that stands out to me. Um, and I love, I use love as, as hate in this context. Um, and in it, she says, um, in areas of the, of, the, of the country where there are um, higher concentrations of ethnic minorities, um, people will be less likely to develop British values. And that's just taken for granted and, and moved on. But what's interesting is that she doesn't say um, in areas of the country where there are higher concentrations of the ethnic majority in the UK, let's say white people, um, that they will be less likely to develop British values. So the problem is not high concentration of um, ethnicities per se. It is that there's this implicit assumption that if you are white in this country, you will be born with British values. 
And if you are a person of color, you will need to learn them and cultivate them. And I think that there is, is the kernel that really tells us a lot because it tells us that Britishness, whilst it kind of masquerades as all these cute and fluffy things like cups of teas and cues, is actually unable to define itself beyond whiteness and solely as whiteness. And we saw that obviously in very, uh, and we see it every day in very violent ways. Um, but the ones that come to mind, obviously, over the last few years, the Windrush scandal being very clear recognition that, you know, um, whilst the uh, the migrants and the generations of their descendants from the, the time of the Windrush first arriving in the UK may have seen themselves as British and may have been told that they were British, the precarity of that Britishness became very evident when you could be deported, you could be literally um, sent to somewhere that you may never have, never have been before um, or really have, have, have any link to and, and lose your family and your health in many cases to, to kind of put it in the context as well of what we were just talking about. I also think about um, Shamima Begum being stripped of her citizenship um, two years ago and the fact that actually I think it was news last week or two weeks ago that um, she remains um, kind of stateless, right? So she's still in this position of trying to get citizenship. Um, the Bangladesh um, state re refused to give her a citizenship there. Um, and I think this this whole story kind of revealed to me that there was also this, this the conditionality to Britishness, right? So um, it was never this thing that you were guaranteed by being born here. Um, it suddenly turns out that if you're a person of colour, it was conditional upon your, basically your political obedience, right? And so we don't even need to have a conversation about what Shamima did or didn't do, um, because really it's a question of whether what you do or don't do should have any implications for your citizenship. And obviously, we, we know that, that it does and that that itself is a really big thing to think about. Um, but I think the problem then that I find myself with is, OK, so if this is the context that we live in currently and we want to think about reimagining it to be more inclusive, um, does that mean that, you know, so that the, the winter generation are not deported so that Shamim Begum is not stripped of her citizenship? Or does it mean actually reconstituting um, the, this notion that whiteness is all that Britain is? Or do we actually need to think about what Britain is and, and not assume that it is a nation? Because Britain at its heart is empire and has only ever really meant empire, at least for the past you know, 500 years. So even the fact that today you can, you can get a medal that says British Empire Medal, um, you, can, you can be a member of the Commonwealth. The, the, for all the reasons that you know many people have already outlined, colonialism is live and present. So British Empire is therefore live and present. And I just wanted to highlight a few things that you know I'm sure are in our minds right now. You know, this weekend or last weekend, sorry, was the third um, anniversary of the Grenfell Fire, um, and we think about the ways in which the lack of accountability around the people who died in that um, fire and around the kind of the reasons that they died also tell us about, you know, which people's lives are seen as lives that matter to the nation and which don't. We think about COVID and we know the disproportionate rates at which people of colour are dying in this country. We think about detention centres. We know the disproportionate rates at which kind of contagion and spread of virus will happen in places like prison detention centres where people of colour are disproportionately um, held. Um, I think about also the fact that when I was in the beginning of lockdown, I was um, stuck in Pakistan and um, a point that was made by the government there was, you know, what, how do we provide the resources to go into lockdown when the majority of our resource goes as um, a debt repayment to the West? Um, what does it mean to be in, in this live situation of imperialism that kills people um, presently? Um, and so there's many more examples of what I could say, but I guess the point there is that um, I, I use um, uh, Dr. Nadine El, El Anani's um, phrasing here where she says that we are living in a domestic space of colonialism. Um, and so she actually outlines a really, I think a really brilliant argument, um, which I'm probably very like conveying very terribly, but she um, sort of explains the way that after slavery was abolished, um, reformed, let's say, um, the state sponsored payout to slave owners, which was the biggest bailout in history in the UK, um, apart from the 2000, until the 2008 bailout of the banks. Um, that money that was given as compensation was then reinvested, obviously, in, in commerce and in industries and in institutions that to this day, um, obviously are unevenly accessed um, in the ways that obviously way they're just outlined, for example, but universities, um, every, everything that sort of we, we interact with day to day. And what it means is that wealth remains unequally distributed, land remains unequally distributed, property does, and that is directly, not indirectly linked to slavery and colonialism. And so 
she then talks about the way that immigration laws um, become the way that that unequal distribution is sort of concretized. So say in 1961, um, when you have um, a, a really important immigration act, it's the first one that's, that kind of includes this notion that um, you're, you you can access Britishness if you have a parent. So it's this notion of patriality. So if you have um, a parent who was born in Britain, now at that time, um, you that was only going to really be the case for about 98, I'm sorry, that was going to be the case for 98% of people 98% of people for who that was the case would be white. Um, and so there, I think you see that moment where they go, uh, this empire thing is, is having a really bad like backlash. You know, this has gone how we planned. So bam, let's just concretize what Britishness is to something to do with lineage and therefore to do with ideas of ethnicity and race. Um, and so I just outlined that because I think all of that context and so much more that I haven't mentioned is necessary to even approach the question then of how do we reimagine British or Britain in a, in a more inclusive way? Um, and I think what that question fails to account for is, is Britain justified? And I ask that as a very serious, not facetious question. You know, is, is it a justified construct? And I think if something is built on so much violence, if it depends on so much violence, um, if it depends on death, destruction, extraction, me personally, I, I don't think that's a justified thing. Um, and so what I then would ask is, why reimagine? Because to me, reimagining falls within that bracket of reform, right? So we're, if we're trying to imagine, you know, more exciting futures and futures that are transformative, um, to me, this is where abolition becomes part of this convers conversation, because we're not looking to reform the nation state, right? I don't think the nation state can really be reformed, because the only reform um, that we, you know, we, we see it all the time. It's basically inclusion, um, diversifying, um, and you, you're never going to really actually give people the humanity that I think is on the other side of this question. And so the other side of this question then is Britain justified? Is do we need nation states at all? What is beyond the nation state? And so I think often when I have these these conversations with people. Um, you know, we do feel limited to imagining ourselves within nations. And even if you think about kind of anti-racist activism, it often falls within these, these nations. So, you know, what, how can we um, achieve liberation within Britain? Well, can we achieve liberation in Britain if the, the racism exists across the rest of the world? Can we achieve liberation as people of colour, as working class communities, if capitalism and capitalist relationships between the West and the global South con continue in the way they do? And so I think this moment actually provides a lot of um, exciting examples of how we do already imagine ourselves beyond the nation and imagine community beyond the nation. And I actually want to just copy um, or sort of borrow from um, an exercise that I saw um, Jackie Wang do. So um, she's an abolitionist um, scholar and she she does this um, sort of uh, thing game. I was going to say it's not game, but she asks people, um, just close your eyes for a second and imagine um, yourself feeling really safe. And then, you know, everyone does that. And then she says, OK, how many police officers were there? And the point, obviously, is that there were none. I hope there were none. And therefore, you see, safety is really not dependent upon the police, right? But I wanted to ask a different question, which is, imagine feeling like you belong, feeling a real sense of strong belonging, community, love, and hold on to that for a second. And then I would ask you, how many passports did you hold in that image, right? And I think the point is that, belonging is something different and community is something different and we see that in, in moments like these digital spaces create like this i've noticed and i'm sure a lot of other people have that there are ways that we already are existing beyond the nation we're not we're not confined um by those borders as borders as borders are violent and even as violent as they are and as kind of harmful as they are i think what we we also see that we imagine beyond them all the time and we imagine community in different ways and i you know personally i feel like I always find a lot of um, hope in, in the notion that um, Islam has of Ummah, because Ummah is this notion that is community that doesn't really require um, any geography or land or racial or ethnic or kind of cat categories to make sense. It can just transcend them. And you don't, it's sort of a decentralized notion, right? And I wonder, and I think about the other decentralized notions of community that we see, where you don't have to be physically together. You don't have to be um, kind of recognized even by one another, but you belong by virtue of of feeling that sense of love and, and community. And so I don't really have answers about what it looks like, but I guess what I do say, and I, I often kind of find myself when I'm looking for answers is, 
look at what women of color have done historically, because I think I think women of color often have found ways to reimagine everything, you know, um, or not even reimagine, but to have to imagine because the, the institutions that exist don't really work for us. Um, other ways of dealing with conflict, for example, but also other ways of, of, of loving and caring and, and belonging together. So I guess my conclusion is just that, you know, to me, reimagining the nation is really a pointless project. Um, and I would ask us instead to imagine beyond the nation um, and whether a decentralized concept of belonging and safety um, can be there. And I think this is very much central to to the, the um, project of abolition. I think there's no point abolishing, not no point, but I think it can't be a separate to abolish prisons and police, but remain within these bounded notions in our own head of, oh, but I am a Brit. So if we just abolish all the prisons in Britain, fantastic, job done. Um, and obviously, you know, I think people who live at the margin of being undocumented um, or refugees or asylum seekers, they they recognise and they live that revelation that abolition has to include the abolition of borders and of the state itself. Um, so I look forward to the decentralised futures that we are already building in these communities where um, I think, as Imi put it yesterday, we kind of have leaderful um, uh, rather than leaderless um, communities. So, yeah, that's my provocation. Um, I don't think Britain's justified, and I hope I've made the case to you today. Pew, 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 pew. Sorry, I had to do bashment of um, foghorns because there were so many like knowledge nuggets in that and just so many things to ruminate on. The importance of imagination, separate from the system that we currently have, to just validate not only our own knowledge production but again stop centering it in reaction or response to whiteness and w what whiteness means i have so many questions we're just going to have like one for right now and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion a little bit later um but with regards to the nation state i had one idea that just came when you were talking is where can we learn these lessons from the cultures that have existed and continue to exist without boundaries so nomadic culture for example what are the lessons we can learn about dismantling nation states from their philosophies and their ways of being um and then also i think my question is on the conditionality of britishness mm. Um, what that means with a sensationalist media like the one that we have um, and how some of those things might be changed through the work that is being done. Hmm. Hmm, that, that's a really good question. I really like that. Um, I think one, one point to make before I kind of dig into that one is that, you know, when that, with that first point that you're making about kind of other ways of thinking about community, I think, it's always important to kind of zoom out, um, which is like, if you take the historical timeline, right? And um, the nation state is such a modern concept. The nation state literally arises in the 1800s. Um, you know, some people can trace their great grandparents back to the 1800s, that's not long ago. And I think that that really should, should be a, a sign to us. If we can begin to historicize concepts like the prison, like police, like the nation, we can also then go, Ah, if this didn't always exist, then there must have been other ways of existing. And, you know, I think we just have to have to look at no, I don't think we need to. I think the point to make, though, is that we don't we're not trying to copy and trying to like be like, oh, we go to this pre-colonial era, you know, some sort of romantic longing. I think that's not the point. I think it's just actually to take a bit of motivation to remember that the nation is a construct just as much as anything else that may outlive, uh, may need to be outlived by us. Um, and so I think, yeah, indigenous communities, obviously, um, but also just, you know, maybe also in the kind of contemporary moment that we're in, um, we need to think about like, what, what, do we, what do we need from belonging? What is the purpose of belonging? Um, and maybe by asking these other questions around sort of what it is that we feel we get from nation, what it is that we feel we get from state, is it, you know, because I think this is also then linked to questions of governance and how we want to be governed. Do we want to be governed um, and what that looks like? So, yeah. And then on the second question about like conditionality and sensationalism. And yeah, I think like that's a really I think what comes to mind for me when you say that is is just around the fact that kind of political disobedience is so makes you so precarious, which I think is what you're getting at. And I think um you know, even just personally, that is something that I'm so aware of as as somebody who, you know, is kind of has a public platform to some degree and who is aware that, you know, how how many opinions can you really, 
you know, how many times can you disrupt and push and push until you is kind of decided that, oh, we're going to dig through your tweets and find that time you said whatever you said. And, you know, I've seen what's been going on with Ash Sarkar today and kind of tweeting about three oranges and it's turning into, you know, she's clearly a terrorist sympathizer. Um, so, yeah, I think I wonder if, you know, p- at least from what I, I think in this moment is that this is all linked to unlearning, because I think if um, if a larger scale of us were sort of able to unlearn or if, if together we could all unlearn that, you know, there are these narratives of the good immigrant, the bad immigrant, the good Muslim, the bad Muslim, then none of us would really be invested in political obedience. Um, and by that, I mean that therefore, if all of us were politically disobedient, I mean, what what power would sensationalist media have over us? What power? I mean, because you can't portray somebody as a traitor. You can't portray somebody as um, problematic if the entirety of the population are problematic and therefore shining the light back on the state as the problem itself so yeah I don't know I think that's a tricky question but that's just my immediate thought I feel like you answered it perfectly and also with a perspective I've never heard before with regards to um I guess civil disobedience and how that shapes the world that we're currently in and like the whole idea of what Britishness is as a concept as a construct, as fart foolishness. Um, And I guess we're starting to see some of the cracks in that. And I think we will unpack a little bit later. We have so many questions and um, incredible things to get into, but I want to invite Odelia to spread your magic. Thank you. I'm also going to time myself. I just like, thank you for just every time I'm in the room with these women, I'm just like blown away, um, even though I've known them for years now. So I'm trying to connect some of the stuff that they're saying to what um, I'm going to be talking about, which is around like mutual aid and this question of like, what does it mean to be responsible for one another? And uh, very much like Sahima is like moving past these questions of um, like reforming and reimagining is just like, what do, um, what do we need to do? Um, what do we need to show up for each other? So looking to women of color and especially black women for me um, is really important when I think about how we want to show up in this moment. And as why the area said, like, this is the now, this is the now that's always been building uh, Christina Sharp and like her book about um, slavery, she calls it a past that is not yet past. So everything is with us in this moment. Um, and the people who are best equipped to think about how do we move beyond these structures are the people who've always had to do that. Um, and it's less like, oh, I'm gonna like plop into the 17, like 1800s and bring that back into the present as Sahima mentioned, but like, how do we actually just build on this like, almost like this deep belief like here when we go to protest uh one of the things that we repeat often is i believe that we will win um and that comes from this deep sense of you know this idea of defining survival like that is a win that we are like still here we are still building together we are still in community with each other and defining survival um, is really important because it means we have to directly connect to each other and there are too many structures right now that claim to protect us that actually just keep us separate and get in the way of that. And one big flag is we continue to talk about the ways that the internet helps us like um, rethink like who's in the room with us, move beyond borders, but not everyone has access to that. Like that is like number one thing, right? Uh, one of the number one things right now in my mind that has to be decommodified, like in a world in which this connects us um, and especially in light of COVID-19, uh, and how it keeps us confined to spaces, then everyone needs to have access to that. And any denial of access to that is an active act of harm. Um, and so mutual aid is this idea that people take responsibility for one another, but also like are changing the political conditions. So it isn't just about um, making sure that people who need particular aid and support get that. It's also about pushing back against the systems that first created those um, ideas of scarcity in the first place. So there are like two things going on. There's the support um, that is happening for those who need it, but then also like really identifying and pushing against the systems it created in the first place. And the big difference is because people are all like, well, mutual aid is like charity, but it's not because like it's not creating these hierarchies of like, I have, you don't have power systems. It's um, 
really collectively aiding uh, people around you and beyond you with the direct aid that they need. And it's really interesting for me, like how many people like either they, they know it, but they haven't like named it. And naming things is important because when we can name the thing that we're doing, we can start to more actively do it. And so the other day on my Instagram, I just posted some links to uh, some like PayPal's or different ways to directly support black trans women. And I had a bunch of people in my IG inbox say like, oh wow, I never even thought that I should just be directly giving to uh, black trans people. And I was like, well, of course, yes, they know what's best to do with money that is given to them. And when you're giving to these larger structures, like you don't know where that money is going. And when people need aid, they don't need it through the, you know, five month cycle of a nonprofit or philanthropy, they need it now. And if we deny that, then we are also participating in active harm, especially when we're seeing so much harm happen um, to trans individuals and especially black trans women right now. Like to, we need to actively get that money directly to them. And so we really have to start decommodifying this idea of like, there's all these middle structures, you know, the nonprofits, philanthropy groups, venture capitalists, you know, cause here I am in the Bay. And they've all convinced society, like, we produce research, like, we produce, like, we know who to give money to, like, we keep people safe. And none of that is true. None of that has ever been true. Um, so we need to start finding these pockets in which we are just cutting that middle person out who depends on us needing to beg for things. And that just takes away from all of our humanity when we we're begging for the very, like, basic needs that we have, like water food, um, you know, being housed, like those are things that can, that exist. Uh, um, in the Bay alone in Oakland, there are thousands and thousands of people who are unhoused right now. And there are hundreds and thousands of empty buildings. And one of the things I thought was really powerful last year is there was a group of black mothers who just took over a house in Oakland. And they were like, well, if it's there, we're going to take it. And then people showed up and supported them and helped them have the things that they need. And then still had to work within these harmful structures of Oakland and the mayor's office, who is not helping the people to then have to figure out a way to buy this home from someone who has just been sitting on this home. And so there's been this movement that's just been like birthed out of these black mothers doing this, of people taking over um, these empty homes, like all across California and in other states. And I, for one, am definitely here for it because there should be no such thing as an abandoned home if people are unhoused so like that. Like we should hear that and ask ourselves, like, why aren't we burning everything down? Because that should not exist. And so even looking at the university structure, because I was thinking of that, because that's um, how we all first met writing Fly Girls Guide is the university makes us pay so much money to attend. Like I think about my undergrad, like something like $50,000. And they're like, this goes into services. Like this is how we keep you housed. Make sure you have access to these wonderful lecturers and you know, giving you this degree after four years. But the way that they have just allows like made society buy into the idea, like I have to pay you $50,000 for access to knowledge. The knowledge is literally all around me. Like I sit in a room, with black women and I get way more knowledge than sometimes in an entire year that I've been at the university. And especially when we look at the now and universities are opening back up in the fall here and they're not doing anything different to prevent the spread of COVID-19. They're having students actually sign off that they cannot hold them responsible if they get sick. Um, they're often the site of, they have the longest red tape when it comes to sexual assault. Um, and supporting victims of sexual violence. And so it's very obviously, what are these services that we're paying tens of thousands of dollars for when there is no actual uh, support of us when it comes to our well being, when it comes to us understanding ourselves as human being and connecting together? And so that's my provocation of just like, how do we continue to cut out every middle structure every time that we are? you know, at these behemoth of grocery stores or, um, you know, we're at hospitals. Like, how do we continue to break these systems down? And when we see a need, that we just directly address that need? And how do we continue to organize with people who are then going to say, like, well, we've identified that we could just directly do this together. How do we continue to 
deplete uh, and make obsolete these uh, middle people. And the last thing I just wanted to touch on is because it's really important to me right now is just the police. And so Haima brought this up, this idea of when we think of safety and community, like the police are, are definitely never there in my mind. And uh, we can't justify the existence of structures that have been built for the purpose of harm. And the entire history of policing has been out of slave catching, out of policing uh, black and brown bodies. And so this movement to defund the, the police, like it needs to continue to be completely separate um, and hopefully just you know break down this idea of like reforming, which actually continues to say that we need to invest in this system because reform leads to more money. They need more money for body cams. They need more money for training. And that continues to be eaten out of everything else that could go to directly aiding people in an area. Like we asked for a $50 million, um, like 50 million or more, like 150 million cut to the Oakland Police Department. And they're suggesting something like a 1 million cut or like 6 million cut to the department. It's nothing. And so we need to continue to say that like these structures don't keep us safe. Um, they don't create community. They don't keep any of those spaces. Uh, and we have to divest from the idea that any of those structures keep us safe. And, you know, as the streets say, we all we got. So let's invest in ourselves. Yes, we are all that we've got. And um, I think you brought up an amazing point there with the intentionality of how we move forward um and that if we are that we got all that we've got um what are the things that we can birth together with our own minds i'm a big believer personally in like not only nothing about us without us is for us whole type davita davidson but um also that everything we need is already within us and that all the answers are already in our communities and already within the thought and the knowledge being produced but the colonial project, the formation of the police state, the um, medical industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, the miseducation, all of these things um, are almost like spaces um, that are there to distract us from the fact that we have the knowledge to remedy these things. Um, and I just wanted to ask before we go into a wider conversation and pick up some of the Q&A, um, what are some of the like historical examples of the type of like mutual aid or ways of directly giving that you've seen that have inspired the work that you do? Yeah, definitely. I've always been uh, just really inspired by uh, the black like trans community and direct aid there, making sure uh, that people are specifically being able to to get funds. And so we over here, so I'm part of a lot of black women's group, just being able to have like lists of names of people, like how do you get to them? Like actually having like emergency plans or getting people out of um, systems. And we're always like raising money to uh, be able to like get someone out of a, a system where they're unhoused or um, get them in a community care together. And I, I would love to see how we can make that faster and more efficient because sometimes it still feels like, oh, I'm, I'm raising money again when like the money should just like be there or we should be able to invest in like the structures that we create um, that make it so that people aren't like trans people aren't unhoused, that they aren't, um, you know, being forced to like fit with these like violent structures. Uh, another area is, well, it's a little bit like, it's like the bail funds. Like I, I like that people can just like directly give and that's gonna go into like getting somebody out of uh, jail and out on bail bonds. because. Bail bonds is one of those things. It's a good example of like we are supporting people being um, outside and no longer like behind bars, but also pushing back on the systems because we need to be getting rid of bail bonds altogether. Like the idea of like a cash bond um, just makes it so that some people are, you know, staying behind bars in these systems and other people get out. And it's this idea of like, well, you're harmful to society because you can't pay money, but somebody who can pay money and offer that isn't harmful to society and can get out. Um, and so just being able to directly give to those uh, bail funds and get people like out while also um, getting rid of cash bail in cities as well. Amazing, and bail funds for me, 
seem completely nonsensical and the reason why Donald Trump has probably evaded so much. Um, but that's a that's a conversation for another day, I'm sure. Um, I want to bring um, Waythira and Sahima back into the conversation. And um, Waythira, one of the things that you brought up in your lecture um, was around the medical industrial complex and how that's a term that might be new for a lot of people, but also link it or have a conversation around epistemicide and that being the destruction of ancient knowledge production of um the way in which epistemology is created and um when we look at like the epistemicide of ancient medicinal practices or communal practices across the globe how the new complex were um dealing with on the day to day has continued to erase those practices. Um, so just like thoughts um, on that would be much appreciated. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, one of the reasons why terming the medical industry in terms of an industrial complex similar to the way that we do with prisons is because um, uh, sort of hospitals, uh, medical in, uh, institutions in general, um, are also a means of detaining and policing uh, people and policing their bodies. Uh, so it goes back to, you know, which bodies um, can work uh, and which ones can't. And what do you do with the bodies that can't work? We have to construct these ideologies that justify locking people up. And some of those ideologies involve criminalizing these communities. And some of these ideologies involve pathologizing communities. Um, and so you can see that the medical industry is, or, or medical institutions are just another arm of um, sort of exploiting or, or abusing certain communities uh, in ways that seem justified. It seems like a good idea that if somebody's having a mental health crisis that they should be sectioned and looked after, et cetera. And that can be true, but um, the purpose uh, of most of these sectionings, particularly when it um, we're dealing with people of color, with working class people, uh, with migrants, uh, isn't care. Uh, it's simply just getting these people out of the way. And like I said earlier, if possible, finding new ways to profit off of them if they can't produce uh, surplus labor. Um, and on the point of epistemicide, um, I think that's really interesting. One of the Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is how so many of these knowledges haven't actually simply been dismissed or erased. They've been co-opted by Big Pharma um, that steals this knowledge, um, hoards it uh, using intellectual property laws that can only benefit um, Western institutions, these big pharmaceutical institutions. Um, and so they become the gatekeepers of, of medicine, the researchers that, you know, build on these um, indigenous, this indigenous knowledges become the gatekeepers while at the same time um, sort of devaluing these indigenous knowledges, saying that these are people that have never given us anything worthwhile. Um, and that makes me think as well about what I said earlier about sort of disability being a, a social construct that is also constituted through uh, race and gender. Um, and thinking about able-mindedness, for example, and how so much of that is shaped by racialized and gendered norms. And so our own knowledges of how the world works, um, because they aren't, they don't form part of the status quo because they challenge the status quo are then pathologized. Um, and so the notion of able-mindedness um, and the able-mindedness that medical institutions are, are seeking to create um, are actually exposed as deeply political. So to go back to black people's justifiable uh, lack of trust of medical institutions, um, that can then become paranoia that can become aggression, uh, you get enough of those symptoms together and you've got an illness that you can then use to detain this person or to otherwise delegitimize the perspective that they're offering. Um, and so you've got erasure on multiple levels. You've got this erasure of the knowledge of how to treat people, um, but erasure um, of the knowledges of how the world actually works and functions. Because um, again, to use gender as an example, you know, for centuries, millennia, women um, who won't stay, keep in line, um, have simply been labeled sick and detained and put somewhere else. Um, so in this way, knowledges of how the world actually functions are also erased uh, because you're called crazy um, if you describe the world as it actually exists. And the able-mindedness that we're trying to create is simply um, uh, a docile um, civilian subject uh, who doesn't question anything or who knows not to question things out loud. Um, so you get erasure on multiple levels there. 
Thank you so much. And I think a lot of this harking back to the formation of eugenics or scientific racism to justify these ways and these practices that we currently see today being um, so prevalent and institutionalized to the point that, like you said, when we call it as it is or say how the world actually functions, we're gaslit and we're institutionalized. And the, the immediate and long term harm that that continues to have on black and brown communities is devastating, um, especially in the current pandemic. We've seen black body, particularly in the UK, be four times more likely to contract the disease. But then also we know that when we go and we talk about our pain, we're, we're also not represented in the amount of numbers that of hospital admissions when it comes to COVID-19 in the UK. Um, and then we also have the formation of apps like Babylon that were set up as data surveillance for majority black and brown communities. I mean, I just think it's a joke because they literally called it Babylon and I don't understand why anyone put their details on anything called Babylon. Um, <laughs> but that's an aside, Nick. Um, I have a question for Sahima, and it's courtesy of Tanya, who says, would it be useful to reflect on the ways in which the different repressive structures of the nation state affect groups differently, e.g. police targeting black people disproportionately, as opposed to security state targeting Muslims disproportionately, as opposed to order border regimes currently targeting Eastern European migrants disproportionately, especially Albanians. That is to imagine our movement towards the horizon of abolition. So, okay, so I think, um, I guess I, I feel two oscill like opposite almost <laughs> feelings about that question. And I think um, on the one hand, I think, I, basically I think like with, if we look at abolition in the UK, I think the field is already very expansive in the sense that how I would describe it is that there are lots of grassroots organizations that are abolition oriented, right? So some of them are working on border violence. Some of them are looking to um, close down detention centers. Some are looking to, um, you know, demilitarize the police or um, to, you know, end the way that policing is, is being kind of infiltrating the um, social care, social services through counter extremism and that kind of thing. And I think the point is not to separate these things, because I guess one thing that I would say in terms of that question is what when we kind of set, siphon off these things in that way, I mean, what do we make then of, for example, an undocumented black Muslim? Like what where what is the priority for them? Because I think I, I always try to think back to um, the idea of centering the margin. Right. Mm -hmm. um, is it bell hooks? I think it's bell hooks. Yeah. Centering the margin. Um, and I think that that's a really helpful way to think about things because if you use a vantage point of somebody who is like facing kind of the extremity of state violence i think you can then recognize these things are not disconnected right and so i think in the uk the conversation for example i'll just give you an example and then the conversation around defunding the police in the uk is is already been co-opted and what i mean by that is that if you look solely at the police you would think yeah this makes sense let's defund the police this is really violent fantastic but if your vision didn't extend to the wider apparatus, which includes counterterrorism and counterterrorism policing and border policing, I think what you would miss is that already counterterrorism is essentially what happens if you reform policing. So mm -hmm. counterterrorism, it, it through if we take the example of the prevent strategy, you say no, no, we don't need policemen because we imbue the logics of policing to teachers, to uh, mental health workers, to social carers. And we say to them, you have the authority and the um, legitimacy to decide if somebody is exhibiting signs of violence. Right. And so what we see is, you know, that's not changed or, or aided the ways that we deal with harm. Because the police obviously are not really dealing with harm. Um, uh, and then by doing this kind of um, outsourcing policing to these to, to professionals, basically, you're also not dealing with harm. And, and what you're really doing, I think, if you separate those things is, I, I, I believe it's allowing the state to co-opt our movements more easily because I think they can kind of then what's the word, I suppose, almost compromise, almost, it's, it's almost like dividing, dividing and compromising, let's say, <laughs> not dividing and conquering, but dividing and compromising, because we, you know, I might think, fantastic, detention centre closed, but how the logics of the border in the university, you know, when, I, when I've ever given a lecture at university, I have to go and show my passport to get paid. 
So how, what does it mean for you know students on visas who then have to attend to show that you know that, that they they're attending and therefore they've kind of got this obedience that means they're deserving of the visa and will I, I basically I guess I'm saying that and thinking that's a detention center example because I think these things are not it's just not it's not holistic to to, to separate these things and I think I know I understand that saying that can be quite overwhelming because it suggests that abolition is therefore this global project that includes every facet of what we know but I think that is true I think that is what it is and what it requires of us and I'll give you another example um I was doing a project a really fun project um University of Arts um students were essentially creating the paraphernalia of a a world where of of a UK that is decriminalized so they initially started out, you know, what posters would be on that the wall of that world, um, what kind of, you know, what leaflet might you see on the floor of that world, that kind of thing, right? And so the group I was working with, they had decided they they were thinking about um, homelessness has been decriminalized. So, um, or I like that um, Odibi kept talking about people who've been unhoused. Um, and I think, so we started there and we were like, okay, so it's been decriminalized, fantastic. And then what they realized very quickly is that, okay, so what we need is social housing in this world. Oh, okay, but... We also need access to social housing for people who don't necessarily have documents. OK, but then how do we, we we need to also be able to show that people have different needs and there's inequalities without them having to expose that they, you know, what, what kind of do we want to link that to ethnicity, nationality, gender? And I say that because I think the, this project of imagining can't be taken lightly. It's very intricate. And um, to even try and imagine just getting rid of one bit doesn't make sense because when you start when you start thinking you realize this is not it is, it is impossible it's impossible to, to remove the counter-terror apparatus um mm. without removing everything else basically and that these are intersectionally they're, they're compounded 100 percent. we can't compartmentalize these issues and just say that they disproportionately affect this this and this and whilst it's important to have that nuance and that understanding of those hardest hit um an abolition perspective really does start from scratch and there being that importance because I can't remember who said it I, we don't live single issue lives I don't know if it was Chimamanda I'm not quite sure but the idea of us having a single story when we know that actually our healthcare impacts our city planning impacts our access to mutual aid impacts our like our sense of belonging and we brought up a little bit earlier the Commonwealth Games which is of course going to be in Birmingham very soon mm-hmm yay um and the fact that the um the welcoming festival as of itself is 150 million pounds just for like the opening ceremony that's the budget they've been given but again we still can't get reparations um if anyone from the commonwealth committee is watching this today you could divest your money and completely get rid of the commonwealth games and maybe put that back into the communities that you're gentrifying in birmingham but that's that's a conversation for another day but the fact that we don't start to, that we compartmentalize these conversations and um the impact that they have um being intersectional is part of the problem of how we've got here um and part of the problem of if we're trying to deal with these issues we really have to look at them from the multiple ways in which they are impacting black and brown life and undocumented life and migrant life in this country otherwise we won't get a holistic picture just like he said um Thank you so much for that. I'm going to come back with a question of like, what is the road to abolition in a bit? But I wanted to talk to you, um, Adelia, about um, the the act of active harm, which you said a little bit earlier um, with regards to talking about um, the passivity, I guess, or the ignoring of the ways in which we continue to cause harm. You also brought up um, the idea of abandoned homes. And I'm really interested in this because I remember as a child being very confused why there were abandoned homes and then seeing homeless people. And just being like, this this doesn't make sense. Why would you not just put a community scheme where people are learning skills of how to redecorate and you do all these different things and we start to imagine and we build more community in those spaces. And so we don't have to have abandoned anything and I just want to like invite you to dream for a little bit um and move away from that the act of active harm what does that future look like for you yeah I also just wanted to note that it was Audrey Lord who said um 
that we don't live single issue lives. So yeah, I don't know if someone put it in the chat. Uh, yeah, dream beyond that. I mean, it would look like everyone gets to live in the type of housing community that they would, would like to. I think it isn't just about like moving from like, let's take over a, abandoned homes, which we should, um, and they just should be lived in, no exchange of anything. But there also has to be this movement towards what does community and housing look like for people? And I say that because, you know, especially what I see here in like Oakland and San Francisco is it's like, it's all cute and fun when like a bunch of white people want to live in a house together and they're like, look at us, this intentional community, like living together. But then when other people want to do that, it's, um, it's a danger. You know, there was um, the ghost ship fire that happened here because uh, there are conditions that people are forced to, to live in that uh, I forget how many people um, were killed in the fire. I think over 20 because people are forced into living conditions that aren't safe, but they need to like move underground so that they are moving moving beyond um, how high the rent is and like the threshold that the city and others have created for living. Uh, and then also people don't get to name how they want to live. So when we have um, unhoused communities that are very large and they, they tend to be tent communities and then people want to put them in uh, single apartments. Like I want us to like dream beyond like, what does it look like for us to also listen to people about how they would like to live? Because when we put them in these like single um, units, whether it's a tiny home or like an apartment, we have separated them from community that they have like radically created to take care of their needs and help one another. And and so that we know best and we're going to put them in this other situation and um, mental health starts to break down because you're away from the people who care. But we think, oh, check a box. They are housed now. We've taken care of that issue because we don't allow people to just name the things that they need. So when I, I dream about what housing looks like in the future. It isn't just like taking back all these spaces that are abandoned, but it's also letting people name and cultivate the types of community and housing that they want. Mm, I think... Yeah, that's so powerful and something that is often ignored because of the neurology of power, which Suzanne Elian is looking into and I won't stop talking about because it it's just such an interesting um, concept about how um, our empathy kind of diminishes when we are in positions of power. We feel as if we can speak on behalf of and with authority on behalf of without even having those experiences. And that same idea of that everything, all the answers are already within us. Um, and so why would those people who have ha had those experiences not be the consultants? Why does someone always have to advocate on behalf? And I think that's what excites me about the future is being able to hold people to account to that standard and just generally cussing people out when they don't. Um, that could just be me. We have another question from Hong, and this is to everyone in the group. Um, I am pro everything you are all saying. Yay. Um, how does it come into conflict with consumerism? Look good, live in a house of our choosing, buy nice clothes, etc. How can we make safe compromises in the world we live in today? Anybody? Um, I can sort of jump in. The first thing that that makes me think about is how much consumerism is tied to happiness. Uh, so a large part of the reason that we're buying all of these things is because we believe that if we have them, it will make us happy. Uh, and it makes me think about um, Sarah Ahmed, who's um, a British feminist who wrote about how happiness is political. Um, and so I think that any anti-capitalist project uh, will always be forcing us to question the things that we automatically assume make us happy um, and question whether getting rid of those things is a compromise or whether we are freed, we are more free. Um, like when we get to a point where we no longer feel like we need these things uh, to be happy. Now, of course, you know, we can still look good um, in a communist future. We can still live in a house of our, of our choosing in a communist future. We can still have clothes that we like, I'm sure. Um, but in terms of being specific about um, how these things make us happy, you know, these are just sort of like the means of subsistence that, uh, you know, that we purchase with our wages, that is just another way of sending like the value of our labor back to capitalists. Uh, so it's not simply just sort of vaguely political for us to want these certain things. Uh, there are people that are invested uh, in these constructions of 
these political constructions of happiness. Um, and so I think once we deconstruct them and once we reimagine what a life that is free, not only of um, these sort of arbitrary conceptions of happiness, but of the suffering um, that is produced within the context of these things that make us happy. Uh, I don't think we'll be as when we're able to move beyond that. Now, I'm not naive. I know that uh, it's a really big question that we have to ask ourselves. What are we willing to give up uh, for evolution? What are we willing to give up for liberation? Um, and yeah, I'm not naive. I know that it'll be harder for people than others, but it just highlights the importance of imagination and imaginative work uh, in feminist and anti-racist work uh, and letting people know that they're allowed to dream bigger um, than just the fancy house um, and just the nice clothes, they can have more. Yeah, I might just jump on that um, to add as well, like I, I, I read something recently, um, which was kind of deconstructing um, the the like colonial modernity as a mindset within ourselves and um so one of the things that it was highlighting was that you kind of have this shift um of like uh what it means to be human and so to be is to have um is the way that this um writer was putting it who i can't remember <laughs> conveniently um so but i think what's interesting there is that like where you have this epistemology this understanding of the self where to be is to have it also the equation works the other way around too right so to have is to be so if you do not have you are not so we see that reflected in the way that you know if you don't have property you're less worthy you're not really human if you don't have citizenship you're less worthy you're not really human and i think that logic of cons consumption really seeps into sort of our understanding of humanity full stop but i also think that what's you know important to think about in this particular moment is how consumption is also bound up with performativity and so we kind of think about um having politics like it's a politics that i have and i show you i have it by buying the t-shirt that says i have it um and so i always love to use the example of you know that i'm a feminist t-shirt that's made in a sweatshop by you know women of color somewhere in the global south and i think that's such a good example and the reason i always raise it is because capitalism is capitalism re-strategizes a pace that we do not and i think that is fundamentally a really scary thing and it means that we're constantly having to evade the co-option of our goals and so i guess what i would just say is you know in, in this question about like cons consumption and, and um compromises is i think we have to remain really aware and really on our toes and able to evade you know the moment when <clears throat> we are kind of able to you know go into stores and buy like i'm an abolitionist t-shirts right i think that's gonna mm -hmm. happen very very soon and i think we have to understand that that there's something there's a reason that that's happening um yeah that's just some reflections not necessarily a conclusive thought on, on that question reflections are all we ask we can't have conclusive thought on on like <laughs> anything. it's also what makes things concrete and a problem the fluidity of all of it is where i think we find the opportunities um and yeah your thoughts are always just like Phew! anyway so thank you thank you for sharing um Ardina, did you have anything else to add on that point no i just wanted to echo that you know i was thinking about how much like the clarification right now is happening of like black lives matter shirts and corporations taking that um over and while we want conversations around abolition to become something that happens more and more in the public sphere. We have to be careful about what happens to things when they move to the public sphere and who is moving them into the public sphere and it hasn't moved there because it is no longer looks like the vision that we dreamed. Mm, thank you so much for highlighting that. And I have one last question um, before we wrap up today and leave you guys to go on your merry way. Um, that sounded so British. Sorry, I just caught myself and was like, what? <laughs> um, what is the role of love in moving forward and within all of the work that you guys are doing? Uh, I'll start. It's everything. <laughs> everything, everything. Like, just to be able to, like, loving someone to me is like seeing just like, the, the mirror of all the things I like want for myself and dreaming of in that other person and uh, being open to like seeing them as an individual as well, but seeing them as like part of my life. And so if I love someone, then I have to act, you know, like love is never passive. Like my love 
uh, whether it's someone I know individually or just like love I have for black community, like love that I have for um, communities of color, then then I have to act. It drives me to act, to like sit in place um, is, to, is to not love. So I think we need to continue ask yourself, what does it look like to love outside of ourselves and what um, are we being called to do through love and what do we have to abolish reimagine, move beyond, uh, because love drives us to do that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I completely echo what Adelia just said. Um, I love the, particularly the idea that, you know, love requires action, um, and it's not like something you do from the sidelines. Um, I've been watching a couple of um, videos r recently about, um, uh, like, abolitionist um, or kind of transformative justice approaches from um, an Islamic faith perspective and something that I think you always comes to mind when you think about faith perspectives and these things is is love and the center central place of love but love is something that is so um, profound and I was listening to this professor and she was saying that um, if we understand um, love as empathy and empathy requires you to feel pain when the other feels pain. Um, she was saying that, you know, we, we live, and it kind of speaks to something that came up earlier as well around the ways that, um, you know, particularly black people, um, this idea that the black people don't feel pain and the ways that that's kind of been constructed for us so that many people do, do believe the threshold of pain is, is much higher for black people. Um, and I think what, it, it therefore requires a real effort. Love is effortful to to really feel the pain of people who you are not experiencing that pain with them, but because you actually believe you are one and you are community and you are you are all you are all as divine and has a, have as much dignity as one another, then you cannot but act when you feel pain um, in that way. And I think there is a beautiful metaphor um, in the Islamic tradition, which is the the metaphor of the body, right? And it's this idea that. Um, if one part of the body is injured, the entire body is in pain. And I think we live such like almost disembodied and like demarcated uh, lives as a, as communities. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, we can see something really violent happen to somebody, but because it's not us or it's not somebody who's racialized like us, um, we're able to sort of disconnect from ourselves. And I think love is also holistic. Love is love is kind of overpoweringly big and it, it encompassing. And I think in that way, then love requires of us to, to submit to it and to surrender to, to what it requires of us. And that to me is really exciting and really like, it just kind of means that we don't have to obey any of the norms or any of the procedures we are told to obey. And, and love really just allows us to, to recognize that more important than any, uh, anything else is the well-being of one another. And when we're truly invested in that, then I think we can kind of forget about the security of state and capital and nation and whatever else and 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 just want want safety and 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 uh wellness for one another. So yeah, love is love is everything. I agree. Thank you so much, Wait there. Yeah, I mean I'd i just echo the really wonderful things that Dina and Sahima said and just I think acknowledging all the things that they say love is um, also requires accepting and dealing with the fact that the way that the world is today, we can't love in those ways, like our capacity for love is so limited. Um, and so we should want to unlimit it. Uh, and that should be seen as part of what revolution requires. Um, so I think that requires a level of humility. Um, you know, when Bell Hooks writes that we kind of have to be taught how to love. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just something given the way that the world is structured that comes as naturally as it should do to all of us, even as we might want it to. Uh, so yeah, when I think about love in the context of evolution, there's the humility of accepting that you have to be taught how to love. Um, and yeah, also seeing that, you know, I, in the way that I think about how capital um, distorts our love, I'm thinking specifically about the love that I provide to my parents, for example, after a day of work um, to like ease the transition from working to, to resting. Uh, and understanding that what that act of love does is just, again, recreate them as workers. It makes it easier for them to work again tomorrow. And it's just this devastating knowledge that so much of that so much of what capital does is rob us of the ability of, of the ability to love to our greatest capacity um, and love in ways that aren't bound or co-opted um, by power structures. And so I think, yeah, we just have to want that love that Sahima and Delia 
um, have described and be very specific about the things that we need to do in order to be able to love that much. Um, yeah. Thank you so much and thank you for bringing the G bell hooks into the conversation. Your work over the last couple of years has just completely transformed the centering of love in everything that we do and as our praxis for me personally. Um, and looking forward to how we start to build spaces and learn and understanding of love away from violence, away from the things that we've been told our love um, in order for us to get a more clear picture of what is possible moving forward. My G Immy's back in the house. Pew, 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 pew. Come on. It's a t-shirt. So how am I? Are we burning the t-shirt down or nah? No, I'm joking. Um, love is, love is, love is the movement. movement. And I got this after I met Conda Mason, who's based in Oakland and was one of the founding directors of Pub Oakland when it was first coming together and so I just I, that was seven years ago and um I was I calculated that I at least wear it like a hundred days a year and I definitely wash this so we're on like 700 wears of this but I didn't realize I was wearing it um so on this right now and I was like yo guys like yeah it's the movement um, Come on. I just wanted to ask one before we wrap up one last question to everyone and it's just the bullet point <laughs> type thing but who are, Emmy's just shouted out Conda Mason, like the people who have changed our thought or impacted, I've mentioned bell hooks, or the people we want to shout out who are doing the work now as like a signpost um, to this, the incredible work that keeps going on. I know Waythera brought up the Bare Minimum Collective and I've already have a Google tab up waiting. Um, but if we could just do a quick fire list of people that people should know and then over to Emmy. Okay, while well, people are thinking then, because give everyone a second, I'll start with that then, because Conda Mason is the one that like changed my life, hundred percent, and she painted this on the wall of of that building, and it and it everything changed because of gentrification and like loads of stuff. Um, but basically, yeah, Conda in the now and today, Ashara in the now and today, who helped um, Ashara Ekendayu, who helped to co-found that, um, and um, yeah, loads and loads of loads of brummies that are on the crowdfunder and beyond crowdfunder list and all of you guys because i feel like when people say like what, what's going to happen and how we're going to build this future uh hello we literally got people imagining it right now who are incredible it's not like oh how are we going to do it um defunding the nation state and thinking beyond it you know like we're already there and 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 so this idea that we're waiting for these people to come and help us is like i'm saying this for the audience right like here they are here they are the last five days here they are everywhere all the time um so we just got to pay more attention to that but yeah the elders though elders shout out to the elders man all of them came before us every day people are on their shoulders um who wants to go first i can um there's <laughs> So many people, uh, but I, I will shout out a few people who are really influencing me right now when it comes to um, abolition, obviously the work of like Angela Davis, Mariam Kaba, um, and then when it comes to mutual aid and like creating community, Mia Birdsong and Amber Butts, who are both um, amazing black women who are from Oakland and doing amazing, amazing things. And Mia has a book recently uh, coming out, it, did, it already came out, called How We Show Up. So I definitely shout out to getting that book. Um, I, I think uh, I just like wanted to shout out you guys as well because like I know you might hate it but Imi and Ali are like what you do you, you were literally movement building and I feel like so much of the most honestly in the last two years like the most radical and most exciting um, kind of conversations that I've been able to be a part of have been hosted by and with you guys so um, I think like yeah that's that's definitely not to be overlook the work you're doing and um, I've been really excited recently by the work that um, an organization in the US called Believers Bailout are doing and that's again because I kind of come from a faith perspective when it comes to like the world <laughs> I don't know what that means a faith perspective I am a Muslim um, and yeah I think they're just really like rooting um, abolitionist um, kind of praxis in 
faith. Um, and I was just going to say, I also um, have been collating recently just like a little document, particularly for like South Asians and non-Black people of colour to try and unlearn um, white supremacy and, and not be invested in anti-Blackness. And on that, there's sort of a list of lots of different um, organisations like Campaign Against Prison Expansion in the UK. Um, but yeah, I can sort of link to that. It's on my Twitter if you find me on Twitter and you can see the different groups in there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Wayfera. Um, yeah, obviously shout out to our co-author Lola, um, who's constantly teaching me, um, and she's in the Bare Minimum Collective as well. Um, I've also been reading along um, about sort of capitalism and disability recently, so people like Marta Russell um, and also Sammy Schalk, um, in terms of talking about how race, gender um, also feeds into the creation of disability. Um, and as much as I hate to, to mention white men right now, um, I was very conscious throughout that I, I, I've just read Marx and Lenin very recently. Um, so that's just percolating through my head and there was all this discourse on Twitter about how we each read them, but I think we do. Um, and also Thomas Sankara, um, who led the uh, yeah, revolution in, in Burkina Faso and he never wrote a manifesto, um, but I recently read a really comprehensive look at his sort of his work and his legacy and learned a lot from that. Sankara is like the love of my life, but that's a conversation for another day um, of just being able to show a different world in practice um, and a different model that centers love, that centers anti-capitalism and all of those things. But we will always have a Blaise Kempare, so we need to watch out for the haters too. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining today. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. And like, basically, some of you will notice um, about this sort of time on the days of the festival, we all get a bit like wild. And it's like our just personal TV show. And it's happened again today. Uh, so if we're mentioning Shaman Alia, we also should mention Liz Pemberton, Black Nursery member, manager, <laughs> who was one of the educators behind these two, who clearly has just been in her spare time raising revolutionaries. So um, big shout out to Liz. Um, okay, so tomorrow is the last day, right? And uh, so this six days festival, it means something really particular. Like we wanted a space to hold loads of things in like balance, well not balance, I'm a Libra, that's why I say balance, but you know what I mean? Like uh, grief and joy and anger and imagination and the future and the past. And just like, we wanted to hold all these things as many different ways as we could. That's why it's called Green, so you can, do whatever you come to rest reflect reimagine or go beyond reimagining um you know there's there's all of that but after this we've been putting together this um dream fund where we want to just start investing in the visions now like investing in like the loving visions and the the future and like whether and obviously we are not we ain't got big money i mean we really haven't got big money at all but like for poetry and film, mini films and mini lectures and writings and zines and comics and whatever to start getting all these ideas like archived or like live archive or onto paper or onto podcast and out there, um, like whatever it takes, that's what we wanna focus on for the next six months. Cause this isn't just like a peering into the future and then we'll just go like off and, you know, carry on with what we were doing. This is meant to be the, a point at which we might remember and not because we want to hold that like we don't want to hold that we just want to go let's let's like get on with it now let's keep staying community with each other and let's keep building together and let's get this stuff beyond just these talks and these videos uh, and one tiny bit of that is to learn from loads of things we've done in the past where we haven't had the time or resource to like make something happen um and of course we can't be that right the whole point of this festival is multiple authors leaderful movements as Alia said uh, yesterday, um, solidarity across struggles um, and intersectionality and focus when we need it, right? Because there's times like Kriya said, like Sahema said, there's a time to focus in on our particular experience and work out the details and heal. And there's a time for cross um, um, solidarity and to have and to turn our attention on the, the real enemies, um, the, the bigger ones, the ones that we want to topple. So, of course, we don't have the right answer to all of you who are watching. But what we do have is a tiny bit of learning for the last seven years, which is after an event like this, don't just leave it right. Then go back and go, right, here's a bit of money to do this, to do that. And we're going to try. And if you're out there from philanthropy listening to me and you want to add to that, I'm just going to tell you straight, we don't want no processing money. We don't need anything for ourselves. 
we don't want any like anything because we happy right we're eating and we're okay and we're not on the front line so we will distribute that and it isn't just us right there's loads of other people doing this there's my one sorry just quickly say on that point of philanthropy if you're giving the money also start reading the book start attaining the knowledge i don't want it to be like your guilt free out of jail card yeah. like you're gonna need to do a lot more than give some and put some checks in. Those checks are gonna be very needed in terms of the taxpayer was paying off reparations for slave masters up until 2015 in the UK. My grandparents paid for the reparations of slave owners who owned them, who and owned their um, their ancestors. So in that vein, I'm going to need you to do a lot more work than just opening your wallets. Do that, absolutely. But also start reading the books and start decolonizing your mind and start doing the work and not just getting a jerk free out of jail card. Anyway, hold tight Maya as well because I know you're about to holler them. 100. So then what I was about to say is like our dream fund is just one bit, right? And we're not looking to hoard power. So we're going to get it in, distribute distribute get things going films power uh, poetry uh, writing building whatever it takes right um but there's loads of others we've got like hundreds of crowdfunders on um of people doing the work right we've got six or seven uh, on the front page of this website we all know people doing the work both here and in international solidarity in like yemen and we'll talk more about that tomorrow with sham as well but like so many different pieces of work so if you are wondering oh where do i spend my money right there's plenty just get in touch because it isn't i'm not here being like oh yeah like civic square needs to hold this i'm here saying we got some stuff that we want to do but then we've got other stuff that we need to like fund and fund quickly. And at the bigger level, 100% listen to Alia, right? Um, the work is 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 much broader. And that's one of the key facets of the Resourcing Racial Justice Fund um, that I'm involved in with people like Fazana Khan and Noni, who's going to be here tomorrow. A prerequisite of investing in that is you start to do the un unlearning and all of that work, right? So any of these get in touch with me and i'll just pass you on quickly to the right people because um yeah all of that as well is not something you want to deal with anyway right can i just say if you had any moment worrying about how we're going to get to this future where we basically uh, completely revolutionize how he healthcare we sent a mutual aid we topple the nation state and you're like reading them and you're like i don't know and i don't know how it's going to happen and you know and it's been decades worth of work well, these guys are here and they are just one or two people in front of the movements they represent of hundreds of people they could introduce you to within their own communities in their own work so this idea that this is just a dream and it's beyond our imaginations is not true we're just now going to start doing the work and build the momentum so remember mm -hmm. that and this has been hard right because i don't want to sit in this all the time like this is not what we're going to do we're going to start building and we're going to start dreaming and like alia said we're going to send to love so on that note, I'm going to ground us out, right? And one of the girls... One more shout out. I'm sorry to be that person. One more shout out for the incredible person behind Mutual Aid UK, um, Eshi, whose contact details and things I'll put on Twitter. But definitely check out their work. They're doing incredible things, managing a thousand projects. And um, they need your resourcing and support as well. 100 Thank you. Right. And we'll carry on with this. Keep sharing them. Keep doing it. Follow the Twitters and Facebooks and everything of everyone. But now we're going to ground out because it's Sunday night. And I've been doing all these different really wicked groundings these last few weeks. And I'm sorry that we've gone way over, but I feel like we just need to come down from this. But last week or two weeks ago, um, Guppy Bola, who's one of the RRJ, uh, amazing medical health practitioner, one of the resourcing racial justice team, got us to do a really simple ground out and you don't, definitely don't have to stay on camera for this if you don't want to right but basically um you you have to get up for a second because you've got to go and get some moisturizer thank you so much adelia wathera alia thank you so much sahema thank you everyone for doing the work loads and loads of love moisturize drink your water i think alia's going to be on bbc at 8 30 tune in loads of love <laughs>